Okay, what have I got done wrong here? Well, I did. I did that. Uh, I'll try it. Okay, let me try it. This. Okay, this will work. Good morning. Good to, good to see everybody out this morning. We've got some people here that haven't been here in a few weeks. Uh, Janice's crew back there, glad to see them again. Um, glad everybody's back with us. Uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Don Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering here this morning and that we can worship you and that we can learn from your word. We pray that you're with our service, that is whatever is said and done is in accordance with your will, and that we may learn from it, that we may use it in our lives to, to glorify you and to bring souls to you and to live our lives better for you. We ask you to be with the sick. We're especially mindful of those of this congregation and those that are suffering from the loss of loved ones and ask that you comfort them. We ask that you... Forgive us of our sins and guide us through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 143, Low in the Grave He Lay. 
Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly they watch his head, Jesus, my Savior. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose. Savior, he tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord, up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes, he arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Paul made a similar statement to that song as he wrote to the church at Corinth. And through the dedication of Paul, we know through his life that he is very committed to his, his task of teaching the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he makes it very clear about who he was being Paul and why he did what he did. Now we might say it a little bit differently in today's language. We might say, well, let me just read the scripture first and then we'll talk about it in just a minute. First Corinthians 15, beginning in verse three. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which was also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Then he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, and after that he was seen, over, seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remains to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by the apostles. Then last of all he was seen by me, one born out of due time. Now, we might say that in our, in our language, you know, that, you know, as we think about Christ and, and what he's done for us through the sacrifice, truly, he did die on the cross for us. Truly, he was buried, and truly, he did raise again on the third day. And we might say, like, you know, there, there, there just isn't anything any more important that I could tell you than that, because our salvation depends on his resurrection. And as you look at those scriptures that I just read, 
Christ, Christ's resurrection was proven by him being seen by many, many people. So we come together at this time to worship him and to also to recall that sacrifice. In particular, the bread, which represents his body, and then the fruit of the vine representing his blood. So if you will, bow with me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings you've given us. We thank you for the privilege of partaking of this bread to remember your son, his sacrifice that he did for us. We thank you, Father, for him, for your love, for his sacrifice. Through Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. What we're doing was instructed by Jesus to do it in remembrance of him. And that's why we do it. Do you imagine him being nailed to the cross as you partook of the bread? Can you, through an eye of faith, see a nail being driven through his hands, through his feet, and that spear in his side, crown on his head? Through that same eye of faith, can you see the blood trickling down from those wounds? Those wounds that heal us through his resurrection and through our obedience to the gospel. Once again, would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here and to partake of these emblems to represent your son's sacrifice to us, for us. Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. We ask you to help us to realize what a tremendous statement of love that was on that day of his crucifixion. Through his name we pray. Amen. We also have the opportunity to lay by in store, according to 1 Corinthians 16, first couple of verses. And the message was to be prepared, prepared to serve however we can. So if you didn't uh, leave your contribution in the praise as in the foyer, please take advantage of that privilege uh, as you leave. Again, let us pray and be thankful for the things that God has given us. Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that you've given us, the spiritual blessings right at the top of the list. We also thank you for the many, many material blessings that you've given to us that we might be housed, that we might be clothed, that we might be, hung, might be fed, that we might be able to carry on your work. Father, we thank you for those blessings. Through your son's name we pray. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow has taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with 
my soul, and Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sighed, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. Number 276, Higher Ground. <clears throat> I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher prayer. My feet on higher ground, my heart has no desire to stay, where doubts arise and fears dismay, though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plain than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, through Satan's darts at me are hurled. Their faith has caught a joyful sound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plain than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll play till heavens I've found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I kind of want to explain just a little bit. We changed gears on Charlotte this morning and gave her a different remote. And the remote she's using today only has one button, and if you hold it down, it goes backwards instead of going forward. And she's not used to that. The other one, I think the batteries must be dead in the other one. And so that's part of the reason. And I think there's also a, a verse in the book that's not on the, uh, the, the uh, film, and we didn't, didn't realize that. So um, don't blame Charlotte. Just be patient, and we'll, we'll get there. Uh, I wanted to go back and, and do... Let me get rid of this. I wanted to go back and, and finish a lesson that I started back in November. And it remembers the words of the Lord. In Luke 24, verse 8, that talks about, and they remembered his words. This is not an optional thing for us, but it, it's a command that we are to remember the words of the Lord. And when we remember those, we need to apply them. We need to use them in our lives. We need to take them and, and use them in our lives. And, and the, some of the topics we covered uh, when I was up here in, in November was we must remember the words of Jesus. 
And, whoops, got two pages there. And we must remember his words on evolution. And we must remember his words on divinity. And we must remember his words about the church. And we got part way through that and ran out of time in November because I get long-winded sometimes. But we're going to, we're going to, we talked about some of that and we're going to start with that again. We must remember his words about the church. And then, you know, what's more important, we are the church. So we need to remember how his words that apply to us and our relationship with him. If you would please turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. And we're going to talk about, it's going to talk about the relation of a man and a wife and how that is, is paralleled with the relationship of Christ and the church. Ephesians 5, 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and join to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. When a husband and wife get married, there are no longer two of them, is there? They become one flesh. They unite. They become one. And that's the relationship we're to have with Christ. When he becomes true, we're to become part of him. He's the head of the body. The body can't function without the head. <coughs> As a paramedic, there are a few things that we can pronounce somebody dead on the scene without doing, without working the person, without trying to re resuscitate them. One of those is the head being severed from the body. I know that sounds kind of gruesome, but we know the body does not function without the head attached. If I'm on a scene and that's the case, I don't have to work the person. That is a given that that person is not going to survive. So therefore the church will not survive without its head. And we're to remember the, the, the words of Christ and his, and his teaching to us. Otherwise, he's not the head. The church does not survive. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, again, it's, it's going to talk about our relationship with him and only a little different perspective. 1 Timothy 5, 6, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, which he will bring about at proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know, there's a lot of people who want to, want to accept Christ as their Savior. But this is a little different perspective, isn't it? To accept Christ as our Savior, we can't just accept Him as that part of it. He has to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. When you're the King and the Lord of lords, you do, people do what you tell them to do, what you command them to do. We as His church need to recognize him as being Lord of Lord and King of Kings and accept his word and follow his word. Again, this is going to go back to what we talked about in a few, a few minutes ago about being the head of the body. Colossians 1, verse 18. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will have come to have first place in everything. Again, we talked about this briefly, that he's the head of the church. If that head is severed, if we're not in connection with the head, it doesn't last very long. The heart stops beating. The lungs stop working very shortly after the head is severed. It does not last without the head. Christ is that head. And we need to recognize him as such and be willing to accept him and, and let him have control in our lives. When, when, we, when our body no longer, when the head no longer has control of our body, it's dead. And if we don't let Christ have control of our being, of us, and that's both our individual and the church, we are not going to survive. We are not going to do well. We are going to die. We're to remember his words about salvation. And this is a common verse, Mark 16, 15, and 16. This is, this is one we use on a regular basis, and, and <clears throat> it's a command to his, <clears throat> and about how salvation happens. Mark chapter 16, starting with verse 15. And he said to them, 
Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. He who does, has disbelieved shall be condemned. What does this verse say needs to, we need to have to be saved? What is, what is the requirement for salvation? <clears throat> it is the, to hear the word, believe it, and be baptized, and at that point, you are saved. The rest of the world doesn't want to accept it this way. That's pretty plain and simple, isn't it? It's pretty plain and simple what the requirements are to be saved. It's believing and be baptized. And if you don't have this belief, you shall be condemned. And we're going, to, we're going to talk here in just a few minutes about what we're going to be condemned to if we don't have that, if we don't follow His instructions. He's, God's the Creator. Christ purchased the church with His body, with His blood. He has the right to set up how we have to do things. Revelation chapter 22 and verse starting with verse 14 through 16. We're going to look at this in a little different perspective, but, but how it is required here. Revelation 22, starting with verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may be, have the right to the tree of life, and may enter to the gates and to the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral people and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the church. For I am the root and the descendant of David and the bright and morning star. We have to have our robes washed. They have to be white. How is that? How do we do that? How do we come? How, what are, when are we washed? And when it's robes, it's not talking about what we're physically wearing. It's our being being washed. It's through baptism, through contacting the blood of Christ, through baptism is when that washing is done. And then through prayer, we can continue that cleansing. And with, what's the results if we don't do this? Uh, it, you know, the, the, it, up in the um, Mark 16, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Now we're going to talk about Jesus' words about hell. You know, we don't spend a lot of time talking about hell. You know, I've, I've, I've said... If you entertain somebody into the church, you got to keep them entertained to keep them in the church. If you scare somebody into the church, you got to keep them scared to keep them in the church. Fear is a very strong, strong motivator, but it's a very temporary motivator. We don't stay afraid of things very long. So we don't spend a lot of time talking about this, but we do need to understand what the results are of not being not being uh, taken on Christ through baptism. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 41 and 42. Matthew chapter 13, 40, starting with verse 41. And the Son of Man will send forth His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks and all those who have committed, who commits lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. And this place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm, I've done a whole sermon on being when I was going to recruit training for Columbus Fire Department and how we did, how we went into fire and sat there and watched it. And we had air that we could breathe. You know, there wasn't hot air. But as we were in there longer, that air heated up in our tanks. And now you're breathing hot air. And you got this flame. And all you want to do is get out of there because it starts to get really uncomfortable. And we, were, we always crawled in and sometimes slid in on our bellies depending on how hot it was because the temperature's a little lower down there when the lower the ground you get. But up, up here where the fire is, it's hot and it's miserable and there's weeping and gnashing of teeth there. And it's because people are suffering. Probably the worst pain I've ever had is kidney stones. And there was no getting away from it. That was part of the worst part about it. It just was a, it, it hurt and it continued to hurt. And then, you, know, you try to get in a different position. And you, the, the nurse, I said, man, I feel like a wimp. And she said, well, you're typical. I would, I would, I'm in the emergency room at Grant and I'm laying down and I'm setting up and I'm on the floor kneeling and I'm standing up and I'm trying to get out of that, 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 that pain, that misery I was in. 
There was no getting away from it until the doctor gave me some good Dilaudid, which then, yeah, that helped. But, he, but there's no going to be any Dilaudid in hell. You're going to be, you're going to be thinking about, you know, how do, I get, how do I get more comfortable? It's hot here. It's miserable here. You can't get away. You're not going to be able to get away from it. And it's not temporary. It's not temporary. It goes on for an eternity. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 40, 49 and 50. Matthew chapter, chapter 13, verse, starting with verse 49. And again, it goes into a, it's kind of the same thing, only a little different. Uh, it's same story, only different um, writer. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and take forth out of the wicked from out the wicked from the righteous, and will throw them into the fire, furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's pretty gruesome description, isn't it? Have you ever been in such pain that you just bit down? And, and I remember the old westerns. You know, they they if they were going to cut somebody's leg off or take a bullet out, they would give them a stick or something to bite on to keep them from breaking from you know to keep them from hurting their teeth. That's what we're talking about is that kind of pain for eternity. Matthew 25, 47, 46. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Eternal punishment and eternal life. Not hard to figure out which way I want to go. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse starting with verse 7. <clears throat> Again, it's, it's going to talk about uh, the hell and, and the results of not being in there, not being right, not taking advantage of Christ coming and dying for us. 2 Thessalonians verse 1, starting with verse 7. And to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. This, what's the result of us not doing what the Lord wants us to we're going to be, not only are we going to be in this place of torment, and maybe the bigger torment, at least emotionally and mentally, is being separated from our Lord, Jesus. Recognizing the sacrifice He made. Recognizing that I could have had this, I could have spent eternity in heaven with Jesus, but now I'm separated from Him. I'm spending eternity in hell, in pain, and torture and torment separated from Christ. Now the other side of this, we're going to talk a little bit about, we don't want to leave it on this bad note. We want to talk a little bit about this, the other side is we want to remember his words about heaven. And as bad as hell is, as bad as hell sounds, and, it, and I heard dad say one time, if you had a if you had a shoebox there of hell, you wouldn't want to put your little toe in it. You know, that's, that would be enough. That would be more than enough. But, but as, as bad as that is, we have the opportunity to go to heaven. Because Christ came and died in our stead, because Christ came and died so we would have a hope, we have an opportunity to spend eternity in heaven. And In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. John chapter 14 verses 1 through 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me also. In my Father's house there are many dwellings. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will may be also. This paints a picture. This, there's a dwelling there place for us. It's going to be a glorious thing. 
But you know what the most glorious part about it is? Is the last part of this. Verse 3. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Christ is going to be in heaven. We're going to spend eternity with Christ in heaven and God. And what a glorious thing. That alone is such a glorious thing. To be able to spend eternity worshiping Christ, worshiping God, singing praises to them, being in that light that knows no darkness. Sounds like some place I want, I want to go. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. It's going to be, it's going to talk a little bit more about hell. Or about, excuse me, about heaven. I'm sorry, I switched gears. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Blessed be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain the inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Let's look at that last, look at that last verse again. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable. Imperishable. It's not going to perish. It's not going to go away. It's going to last forever. It's undefiled. It's clean. It's not dirty. It's not, there's nothing dirty about it. It's wonderful and clean and, and terrific. And it's not going to fade away. It's going to be there. And it's reserved for me in heaven. It's reserved for you in heaven if we do what Christ expects us to do, what Christ wants us to do, if we study his Bible and learn. In 2 Corinthians, verse 5, uh, for, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 1. In chapter, 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This, this thing we're living in today is, is temporary, isn't it? It's a tent. Now, I spent a few nights in a tent. Don't mind being out in a tent for a few nights, but I don't want to live my whole life in a tent. I'd rather go home and call my king-size bed with a nice big mattress on it, you know, but a tent is a temporary thing. We have, a, we have a dwelling waiting for us. We have a house waiting for us that's not made with hands, but is eternal in the heavens. Philippians 1, chapter 21, or verse 21. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. This is, the, this is one, of, and this is my mind, this is one of the greatest scriptures in the Bible that gives us hope. For me to die, excuse me, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. This was Paul. He was, come, he was getting in the last part of his life. And he was, he was making a choice you know, to live or to die. He chose to live because to live was Christ. He was able to open the door for other people as long as he was alive and here. But he was looking forward to that day when he would go on to the next world, when he would go on to heaven, and that was gain for him personally. He made the sacrifice to stay here for a while longer so he could help others find Christ, so he could teach others. For you and I to benefit from his teachings and the people at that time. But to die was gain. It's a better place when we're done here. If we followed Christ, if we're living our lives for Christ. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. This is a little bit of a description of, of heaven and what it's going to be like. Colossians 3, starting with verse 1. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. 
For if you have died and your life is hidden in Christ, in, with Christ in God, when Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also may be revealed with him in glory. How do we get there? You know, we, we thought it was a hiking, and sometimes we're on hiking isn't the best place to be. I remember uh, Lonnie it was with me in the Grand Canyon a couple of Septembers ago. And it was 103 degrees in the Grand Canyon. It took Lonnie and my sister-in-law, Beth, 12 hours to go seven and a half miles to get to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Probably was not their favorite thing in the world to have done at that time. But you want to know what? Beth is willing, and Lonnie too, I think, maybe, is willing, maybe Lonnie, she's been there several times. She's, she's told me she's retiring from the Grand Canyon. But Beth's ready to go do it again not because of that, the trip, but because of the reward at the bottom. And what she got to see, what a lot of people don't get to see. It's an incredible place. How do you, how do you get to the bottom? How do you get to the bottom? Just fall. I don't know. Um, but how do you get to the goal? How do you get to where you want to go? You keep your eye on that. And that makes these things, that makes, you know, if, if you're not going any place, you never get there. But if you have a goal, if you have a destination you're getting to, and you keep your eye on that. It makes these things, these bumps in the road, these potholes, these turns, these ups and downs, it makes them a lot easier to deal with if we're focused on where we're going. If we just, all we're looking at in our lives is tomorrow, why? What's the purpose of life? <clears throat> Excuse me. But if we keep our eyes on God, if we keep our eyes on Christ, we have that, that on out there, that goal that we're looking at, that makes this whole life easier to deal with. Makes it, makes it easier to overcome. Makes it easier to, to, to handle. We're not overwhelmed by it because we have a goal out there. We have a purpose. We know where we're going. We have a map to get there and we know where we're going. Psalms, chapter 119, verse 11. This, this is going to talk about that map, how to get there. Psalms 119, verse 11. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. That's how we get there. We treasure it in our heart. We take it and we, we make it a part of our being, a part of who we are, is how we get there, how we get to heaven. So we don't sin against them. That's how we get there. Are we going to be perfect at it? I certainly hope we don't have to be perfect at it. Christ came and died because I can't be perfect at it, because I sin. And he came to make that. He was the perfect sacrifice. He was sinless. And he died in my stead. I was, and it was the video up here, and I, I watched for it. I didn't see it again. But it brought to my mind when Christ was hanging there on the cross, I believe. And this is my belief that Christ at some level was aware that he was dying for Mike Pittman's sins. Christ suffered and died there for my sins. And he had an, I, I believe, and I, I, I can't point to the scripture that backs that up. But I have a personal belief that he had some awareness of me and my sins. And he was willing to do that for me. If that doesn't bring it home with you, I don't know what does. He also had that awareness for you too. And he died so that we could have a hope. If you have a need this morning, if you haven't put on Christ,
Christ through baptism. If you haven't accepted Him as your Savior, you're not going to have that reward we talked about. You're going to have the punishment. You're going to get what you deserve. I'm not sure I can deserve heaven completely, but Christ has made it so I could have that hope. If you have a need this morning, if you, if you put Him on in baptism, if you've accepted Him as your Savior, and you stumble and fall, and all of us stumble and fall, and you need the prayers of the church to help you get back on that map, back on that road map, to get Christ back in your sights as your goal. And you need the prayers of the church to help with that. We can provide that also this morning. If you have a need, please come as we stand and sing. Kneel at the cross, Christ will meet you there. He intercedes for you. Lift up your voice, leave with Him your care, and begin life anew. thankful father to be able to sing praises unto you and partake of the lord's supper and we're thankful father to be able to hear another message from your word we pray father that you would be with those who are on the prayer list that you'll bless and strengthen each one of them return them to a portion of their hell we ask you father that you would especially be with brother larry and jerry and kathy turns and there are so many. We ask you, Father, that you would bless them. We pray, Father, that you would look after us. And we ask you, Father, that you would go with us when we leave this building and go to our separate homes. And we pray, Father, that you would help us that we might be able to come back at the next appointed time. For this prayer we'd ask in Jesus' name, amen. By way of announcements, I would just uh, remind you of our conference call tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, that's on James chapter 3. 
Uh, Scott and Henner are away this weekend. He's, uh, well, by now he should be yeah, maybe in the thick of it. I'm not sure what time they did their renewal. Well, no, this is Sunday, maybe yesterday. They did the renewal of the vows of his grandparents. So uh, that's the reason that they're away this weekend. Um, there are uh, ties in the box back there on the table if you would like to have some of those or if you have some that you'd like to get rid of, <laughs> you can dump them in that box as well. No good to the School of Preaching down in Florida. Does anybody have any other announcements that need to be made? We certainly appreciate everybody's. Yes, Chris. Some people didn't hear that Valerie passed away. Jim Large's daughter had passed away, yes. And our sympathy certainly is extended to Jim in regard to that. Uh, we're glad that you're here this morning. And uh, I know from uh, some of the messaging on live stream, I know that Jerry and Kate's watching, I know that Chrissy's watching. There may be others that I didn't see or that didn't make comments, but we're just glad that everybody was uh, either here or watching live stream this morning. Yes? Got an update on Larry? Okay, for the benefit of those folks at home, Larry uh, is be, will be reevaluated tomorrow, which will determine when he can get home. And uh, he's scheduled to have the COVID uh, shot this afternoon, and the facility's in does not have any COVID, so that's really good. So uh, remember to keep uh, Larry in your prayers, as well as Steve and Jean, uh, Bobby and Linda, uh, Kyle, uh, the list goes, Jerry and Kate, you know, the list just seems to go on and on. And uh, uh, thank you, Mike, for a, a good lesson. Uh, one that's very Bible-based. We appreciate that. So if there's nothing further, you're dismissed this morning. Have a safe day.